Thank you, uh, Le Liam and Nicole, for what I think was a really, really inspiring uh, story. I was particularly struck by the, the way that Nicole has put the needs of the consumer rather than the revenue generator at the heart of everything that they do in their business. So in incredibly incredible story. Thank you, Nicole. Now for our final talk of the day. There, there are still almost 3 billion people in the world who are underserved by the conventional fin financial services industry. Um, emerging technologies and partnerships are making it easier than ever to change that, allowing more people access to, to financial services and, and through that the ability to participate in the global economy. With over 150 years of global leadership in this space, we're going to take a look now at the bigger picture and how fintech can really change lives and change the world. In conversation with Georgia Francis King of Quartz, please welcome the CEO of Western Union, Ikmet Ersak. That was, that was interesting. I really enjoyed it. Congratulations. It's the most energizing video. <laughs> um, hi guys, my name is Georgia Francis King. I'm the ideas editor at Quartz. Um, I'm joined a, today here with Hikmet, who's the CEO of Western Union. We're going to be talking a little bit about financial inclusion, the way that technology is changing the way that we move money around the world as more people are starting to move around the world. Uh, Hikmet's been at Western Union for nearly 20 years now, so he's been living and leading through a lot of these changes, so the perfect person to be joined on stage. and. We were talking backstage about how heritage institutions are often being fought by these fintech companies is in this way that people assume that one is going to win out and that both of them can't live together. So as an opening question for the amount of time that Western Union has been going, which is over 150 years, this isn't the first storm that you've weathered. So how, how have you already seen these kind of things play out before? Well, um, great question actually. Western Union is 167 years young. <laughs> uh, and uh, the reason why we are still actually on business and very successful actually uh, leading uh, fintech company, I call us, has been because we've been, we've been disrupting our business ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not waiting that somebody from outside will disrupt our business and we've been innovative and we have innovation centers, we look at our business, criticize us every time and we all the time and we really think that what outsider will think about us and before they react we react it's it's easy to be a it's not easy to be a fintech company uh, fintech is fin and tech many companies here what i see also competition is more tech they forget the fin part uh, it's a complex business uh, fintech business means that you have regulatory environment you have consumer needs not only the technical part uh, what happens is that at Western Union, we first look at the needs of the customer and then, then develop the technology part. We don't let us drive from the technology part first and then go to the market. And that has been quite successful um, on, our, on our approach. Actually, you know, we are today with our 
uh, with our business in the digital business, for instance, world number one. We, we lead that environment. We are sending money on a, from a mobile phone from 50 countries to 200 countries in, in minutes. Um, we do settle in 137 currencies. Uh, we do 32 transactions every second. Uh, we, do, uh, we move about $300 billion globally every year. For that, you need an environment which is really very customer focused and understanding the needs of customer in Uganda at the same time in Chile, at the same time in Vietnam, Finland or Australia. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do every second as you could see in the moment and combining the tech part with fin part, it's probably the secret sauce of Western Union. It's also a matter of nowadays we don't have these silos being built up between different sectors that you're working in. You're not finance on one side and technology on one side. And these Venn diagrams are starting to intersect more and more. And the people who are winning in the industries are the ones that can see the best places for those to intersect. And one place that I think is very relevant for your business is immigration. And so there are more people who are moving around the world than ever before. And uh, there was a statistic that um, in 2015, roughly 60% of your customers were migrants sending their money back home to their home countries. Is that, is that about the same amount as what it is now? It grew, actually. <laughs> it's more than 70% uh, actually. Um, our biggest part of the business is the international money movement. It's our heart, what we do. We call it, we have a cross-border platform. And what we do is that actually we collect uh, money from the cent, which are migrants in the consumer business which are migrants. There are about 250 million migrants worldwide who are not born in the country they live now. Uh, basically, it's the seventh biggest nation worldwide. <laughs> we can't talk about the politics, but they don't have a flag, they don't have rights, everybody blames them, but we love them. We call them even heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, they send money from worldwide to 200 countries to their loved ones. And uh, when they do that, they do send more than a transaction uh, the number one reason why they send money back home is education, actually. They really want to send their children back home. They want to give them a better life that they've been through that. Um, is it a, a Filipino nurse in Saudi Arabia? Is it an um, a engineer in the Bay Area? Or, um, uh, you know, someone from Africa here in Portugal? And they come, look for opportunities. They find a job, they create opportunities actually in the places they are, and at the same time, they uh, send back mo uh, uh, money back home. There's about $600 billion every year sent back uh, uh, cross-border to support the families. Without the $600 billion, the world will be in a more tougher position. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is something that we support, we do, and it's, it's a growing business. Uh, the World uh, Bank uh, thinks, uh, you know, last, uh, last year the World Bank gave statistics that they are going by 6%, 5, 5%, 5 to 6%. Uh, we are going by 7% in principal amount, which uh, puts us um, in a quite unique position. Again, to serve these customers, you have to go to the last mile. You can't sit in a corner office or in a garage and develop this business. You really have to understand the understand needs of the customer. On the send side, if you sit here in Lisbon, you have an app, you use your app, you send money. On the receive side, if you're in Bangladesh, or if you're in Zambia, or if you're in Vietnam, you have to understand the people in that moment need, in that moment, in that second, need the money in their local currency to buy something or to just send their children to school or to pay the hospital fees. So the combination of the digital sending part with the combination of the cash availability on the receive side, that's what we built with our 550,000 locations, but that's what we build also from the app side on the send side. And combining that has been a nice journey and it's a growing journey and it's gonna continue. And you've just named a whole bunch of countries that are interacting with each other there. And you yourself are Turkish Austrian, your wife is half Indian. I'm sitting here on stage as an Australian living in America. We're both in Lisbon here now. How does your role and your, the, the, the personally how you relate to your migration story impact the way that you're leading a Fortune 500 company like this? Well, I am obviously uncomfortable with the political environment what's happening currently. Um, if you're in a corner, you blame the weakest. And many politicians do blame now the migrant population that they're, uh, they're responsible for all the bad things what's happening worldwide. 
and it's unfair. It's unfair. Uh, I, I remember as I was a student, um, I didn't have money. I didn't have nothing. I was, you know, fighting for every penny. And I was also in a country which I moved from Turkey to Austria, and um, I was not very welcome with that to my Turkish heritage. And uh, then, you know, obviously it turned out to be a different. Now I am immigrant in the U.S. And um, I, but uh, along my own journey, I feel what the people went through that. You know, their immigration, two ty types, or well, three types of immigration actually. Their immigration where you leave a country to look for an opportunity where the other countries invite you. Australia is a fantastic example where many immigrants came in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, it's changing also there, obviously, uh, where really you create Australia. You create wealth there, it, it, you know, it's a it's story. But there's also forced immigration, which people, if they don't leave their country, they're going to die. Mm -hmm. And you can't let these people down, you know. And in a global world where we live in, where everything is connected, uh, in a different, I call it new globalism, in a different global, uh, globalization, you can't let your other, the seven people down. And I am, uh, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm leading a company who has serves about 150 million customers, which, which don't, don't drive a Ferrari, don't, uh, you know, have a Louis Vuitton, um, Louis Vuitton, uh, shop with Louis Vuitton, but they do live in a way that they contribute to the world economy. And we support that and we are very f proud of that. So, especially in the new environment, uh, where protective environment trying to build walls, um, and I don't think any wall could be high enough to stop the people connection, the people global connection, especially where we are with the tech uh, environment. The new globalization is actually in part to 7 billion people. The old globalization was the globalization we know was driven mainly by corporations like West Union, big corporations, and uh, produced a lot of jobs, uh, gave a lot of wealth, uh, gave access to health, gave access to education. But the new globalization is uh, basically in part to 7 billion people. And one of the re reasons for that is the web connections, uh, the network connections, and the mobile connections. Today, an Indonesian small entrepreneur can build their business without a back office from their mobile phone and sell goods to Canada and do the payments, hopefully via Western Union. So how the role that financial institutions should play in this changing world? Because there's, there's one way that uh, we've kind of come away from this thought that you can't both make money and also make social good in the world. But what is the responsibility that financial institutions have in trying to make sure that many of these people are connected to one another and have easy access to the services they need? Well, our, 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 obviously our business model, we are a Fortune 500 company. We are bottom line driven. Obviously, my first goal is to, uh, to, you know, for the sh um, uh, drive the shareholder value. Uh, and to drive the shareholder value, I really believe you have to uh, you know, be very close to the customers. And our customers are uh, people who don't have the financial inclusion yet. And, you know, in a, or they have it in another uh, other way. Actually, 70% of our customers on 150 million customers do have a bank account, but not in a way that you and me know it. They don't have credit card, they don't have the scoring, they really have a basics on that. So we really allow them to include in our financial services. The financial service companies could be more active on that area because they are future customers. Is the immigrant they arrive today will one day buy a car, will get a mortgage, and uh, generate the wealth in the country they arrive. Or the loved ones back home, they also have their needs. The financial inclusion has to happen there. They have to have an account. And to support that, it's a great business model, actually. And look, guys, it is nothing bad to make money and serve this kind of people. And we won't be in Nepal. We won't be in Siberia or in Argentina or in, in Alaska if we wouldn't make money and we wouldn't, uh, you know, we wouldn't have our 550,000 locations and um, be there and serve these customers. By serving these customers, we drive the shareholder value, but also the customer satisfaction. Because we can look at the people who are currently unbanked and we can look at the, uh, the amount of mobile phones that are starting to be able to bring these people online. 
we can sometimes see these as uh, issues that need to be solved, but there are also huge opportunities. The new customers and new people that can be connected with all these different uh, uh, technologies and access to services they didn't have before. So we can talk about the role that mobile plays a little bit in this. When did you start to see, what has been the journey that we've been on in the past five years or so, and where do you see that going? So, um Actually, the mobile en uh, environment has changed totally. You know, our trip, our um, journey started about eight, nine years ago. I became 2010 CEO, and one of the bets I said that we have to invest in the mobile technology, making, empowering the customer by using their mobile phones to send and receive money. And uh, where do you start with a, a kind of startup? mentality, not in the headquarters like we have it. <laughs> we said, we're going to go to the Bay Area. Okay, we went to the Bay Area and there were, I was looking at the application forms, there were all these tech guys on the Bay Area want to have that job to run our digital business. I did not, I didn't choose someone from there. I have chosen the head of Africa to run my digital business in the in, in Bay Area. And the reason for that was to understand the customer needs on African customer needs. And he went all the way out of Africa, like a movie, out of Africa to, to Bay Area. <laughs> he founded that uh, part. And it's now growing by like, you know, uh, year over year by 20%. And it's a cool company. It's the, probably our most successful uh, place of that. The reason for that was really we, we said that we just want to understand what the, does the African customer need to make it happen to be financially included. Mm -hmm. It was not about the technology only. It was really to speaking in their language with their needs to making the use case adaptable for the customer needs. And it took us a while, but now, um, you know, we are in 50 countries. Yesterday, we just announced a deal with m -Pesa. And now M-Pesa customer can send money from their mobile phone to 200 countries uh, easily. Uh, they have wallets, so you can use your wallet. We just announced uh, an announcement that um, Amazon wants to use our platform to collect money for their customers, where the other customers don't have an access. So this cross-border platform is uh, built in a unique wise and very customer friendly that anyone can link it to make this complex environment of moving money cross border 137 currency easy. And that has been our focus. So you just mentioned wallets then, and I want to bring up a slightly different type of wallet, our crypto wallets. Uh, what is the, because cryptocurrency is often heralded as something that is going to uh, democratize access to financial institutions and um, help the unbanked become banked and such. Uh, what is the role that cryptocurrency is increasingly starting to play in Western Union strategy? Well, um, look, we are moving uh, money on 137 currencies. Why not also in 138 currencies? <laughs> so that's not the case. But you, you need to use your cryptocurrency. You can't, our customers won't buy with a cryptocurrency, pay the school fees. They can't go and buy a bottle of milk. And um, so that's why we are not using the cryptocurrency. If there's a use case, we will use it. The second thing is that, you know, look, in many cryptocurrencies, everybody got excited. But one thing don't forget that um, there's only certain use case use cryptocurrency, not the mass. And we are serving really the customers they have needs to use that. Um, the other thing is that I don't see that any central bank will give away the control of a currency. Um, if you believe on a nation like or an economic zone like European Union, obviously European Union decided to create a currency called Euro. And the Euro, you can uh, with Euro buy a car or buy a, uh, buy a TV or uh, buy anything. Uh, it's a use case that used. And what we do is that if somebody wants to send a Euro money to um, Argentina in pesos, and that's what we do, and that's what we turn that Euro in a pesos by our own cryptocurrency. We create a cryptocurrency about 40 years ago, we call it MTCN. It's basically a 10 digit number that we give to every transaction 32 times every second. 
And this 10-digit ten number, uh, you t let's say you have ten, uh, 100 euros here, and you want to get it in 500 pesos. We turn that with this 10-digit uh, this, um, number travels all the way during the acceptance for the settlement, for the compliance, for the know your customer, for the know your uh, frontline associates, and that goes to the process, and that's in minutes paid out in pesos. It's basically a cryptocurrency which chain, uh, translates the euro for a settlement amount to a pesos, and that's what we created for uh, 40 years, and we do that every time. It works pretty well. I think that it's very, uh, you know, you have to be there with blockchain and cryptocurrency. We invested in, uh, we worked together with Ripple. We look at the settlement part with the Ripple. We did not find the productivity yet there, but we are still there. It's very innovative. We invested in the digital currency group uh, to understand the, uh, you know, what the cryptocurrency can impact our business, the customer needs. And we are continuing to doing these things and being innovative and we will, you know, as we did it for 167 year, years of young history, we disrupted our business. But if uh, today we don't see the uh, customer use cases yet. What other ways are you looking at uh, ways that you can disrupt yourself before someone else disrupts you? Because, you know, Ripple has been quite controversial, but you, you've rightfully said that you need to kind of give things time to see themselves out and play alongside them rather than removing yourself from the game. Because also I think that when you're looking at a lot of uh, uh, countries in Africa and such, they're having to find their own ways around the institutions and the systems that they cannot partake in. So sometimes looking to the places at which you want to serve rather than being the, the white savior complex coming in and just applying what works for us, that's very different. So how are you looking or where are you looking to try to get Get yourself ahead of that curve well uh, so from innovation side we, where we are looking the most is today is definitely um, on the payment side uh, one of our strongest growing business is the student pay did you know that there are about 200,000 students in uh, Chinese student in Spain they want to study they want to pay in their Spain. in Spain only in Spain 200,000 uh, they're studying in Spain so what do they want to do they want to pay their tuition in the local currency for the university fee. And, and the university doesn't want to deal with currency exchange uh, issues, compliance issues, anti-money laundering issues, know your customer issues. They just want to teach students. And so that's what we do. Then we, it's one of the other things that are interesting for me is the medical tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you are, uh, if you go, uh, go to a hospital in another country, you pay in your, in your currency, you go to Brazil, you get your operation, then you fly back or you go to Turkey, you get your nose repaired and you uh, fly back. And that's, that's kind of things you pay in your local currency. That's a huge one. So payments part, consumer payments part is huge. The other thing is the, uh, you know, like on the um, online shopping, uh, many people don't have access to the global market. They have access via virtual. Mm -hmm. They wanna shop online, but they can't pay locally. And we, that's a very interesting area also. You just teamed up with Amazon, didn't you, to be able to provide local currency transfers? Yes, Amazon approached us. They want to use our platform to offer their customers to pay, uh, to have an access to millions of customers. Today, they can't buy because they can't close a transaction. It's just, you know, most of our people here, I believe, have an international card. They can use it. Uh, but many people, there are 7 billion people worldwide, do have an access to Amazon web page, uh, but they don't have access to the payments part uh, or the Alibaba web page or other web pages, right? And uh, shopping areas. I think that's an important area also, and that's what we are very much focused. So besides the C2C transaction, consumer to consumer transaction, C2B and B2C is huge. Also mass payments, we have um, like an agreement with in, um, for instance, with the Italian post, Italian uh, pension, uh, pension plan, they gave us all the names, all the transactions. Say this guy lives in Spain, this guy lives in 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 in, in Denmark, this guy lives in Turkey. Why don't you distribute the money, uh, their pension funds to these kind of people? That's also very interesting. So B two C is also very interesting for us. As one final question before we close off the stage for today. So we've been talking a lot about the economic advantages of being able to include these people in systems that they haven't otherwise been. But what about the social advantages? What about the soft power that financial institutions can play in the future? 
You mean us? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I am probably um, the social power, the political, or just serving these people. However you want to take the question, however you want to answer. <laughs> I think today, in today's world, uh, CEOs and people have to speak up and, uh, you know, really represent people who don't have um, a lot of voice. Think about, uh, we are presenting 150, 250 million people worldwide. They moved from one country to another country, seventh biggest nation. They don't, have a, they don't have a flag. They don't have an anthem. They don't have a constitution. They don't have any rights when they come to a country. They struggle. I think people like me and other my colleagues uh, from uh, many big companies are speaking up for them. And we are proud for that. That's our social responsibility. Uh, we support them. And uh, you know, we, we know that I wouldn't be in this position without them. So that's why I'm their voice. Thank you so much. This has been a lovely, lovely discussion. Thank and you. thank you for your time, guys. Thank you.